held by Velcro, mm -hmm. and the silk just ripples down to the floor. And the two men pick it up, and they wrap it around her as this humongous shawl, and she struggles off the stage. Mm -hmm. It was fabulous. Mm -hmm. and, and they did so many neat things. Yeah, yeah, dance belts. I got stopped in that story. <laughs> Any guys here worn a dance belt? Ah, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah, awful, awful. Straight out of, th you go to theater school and you go to your first ballet class and you're like 19 and, and they put you in a dance belt. Really. I don't know, I don't, thongs, it's, it's not like a thong, right? Because a thong's like a, a string. A dance belt is a huge amount of material that still gets to be the side of <laughs> Sorry, you're talking about your garments. I told you it makes the actors. Yeah, your garments make yeah. the actors. Yeah. Just kind of perked. And then you get suspicious from when they used it last season. Yeah, oh. you just don't want to go there. It's been washed. Don't go there. I, I have uh, two questions, and I'm allowed. Um, uh -huh. uh, and mostly aimed, well, at Sarah. Um, the first is uh, you, you specialize in use of fabrics. On, you do two Astro, but um, and you can answer too. But I, I want to know how you get to specialize in that. Do you did you get trained uh, within a school, or did you have mentors? And if so, who were they, um, and how did they do it? And and the second is, do you ever get to actually make your own textiles? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I I actually have always been interested in textiles, even when I was little. Um, my mother did a lot of like dyeing and stuff at home, so I developed an interest in that and then did a lot of weaving as a kid and that was sort of a big thing for me. I went to York University and there actually they had, I was very fortunate to be one of the students that got to be in the new fine arts building and we had a fabulous dye room and uh, David Pegano was one of the teachers and Sylvia Defend and um, I actually got to experiment a lot with dye um, there. And then after I graduated from from York, I went and actually I'm from Vancouver originally, and I actually went out to and uh, went to Emily Carr College of Art and Design, and uh, I worked with a weaver, and I also worked with a, a dyer there, and did textile techniques, and just as a personal interest um, of my own, and then basically from there, just uh, I started working in dance and did a lot of dyeing of my own dance costumes and uh, continued doing that. And then I continued into visual art. So uh, through v Emily Carr did sculptural stuff with, with um, like I did this whole thing where I took clothing and turned them into animals with plaster and beeswax and things like that. Um, and continued in theater because I, I love that. And, uh, and, and just sort of had learned on the job, but it, it mostly I think comes from a personal interest and a desire, and um, as far as making my own textiles, that has happened, you know, I, I, I know how to knit, I know how to crochet, um, a lot of applique stuff. I was really interested in creating uh, fabrics that didn't exist out there, so making things look the way I wanted to look, mostly from a visual arts point of view, but not from, not, not, uh, not using it, not in theater, so I've used those techniques as well. Uh, I did a show at Humber last year where I used things like AstroTurf and uh, Tyvek and cassette tape and we knit cassette tape to be, you know, chain mail and things like that. So it's, I think mostly the answer is that it, it, if you have a personal interest in it and you're drawn to it, I think that's sort of where it comes from. But there are places out there you can train. Um, they're not very many, and, and they're few and far between, but I think if, you, if you're interested, then they, they do exist out there. Do you remember Leslie Hurry? Mm -hmm. Leslie Hurry was a fabulous designer, uh, English designer, and my first show out of theater school was at the Shaw Festival doing Caesar and Cleopatra, and he was designing the set there, and Leslie was known for his hangings. <laughs> and this is like, you know, 20 by 30 feet monstrous and, it, and 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 I was just so impressed there were I remember um, two or three uh, young designers from Stratford came to work with Leslie and build this hanging because it was 
learning his technique and, and what he was doing. And, I, and it was one of the things I remember clearly about that summer were these young designers living out of little trailers and tents in, in, in a field and every day kind of coming back with dyed hands and, and, and all this stuff. And it was the most magnificent hanging that, I mean, I don't ever know what happened to it, but it, was, uh, it, it struck me as a, a real example of the master and apprentice kind of guild thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a good point, is to learn from somebody, like I've been lucky enough, and in film, I've learned from David Rayfield, who does a lot of film breakdown, and uh, and it's a different technique in film as well, breaking things down, so I think it is, the mentor program is, it's, you know, it exists in Europe still, but it, we don't actually have a lot of that in Canada and North America, unfortunately. Thanks. Are there any other questions, comments? Funny story. Absolutely. I, I'm interested in um, opera costumes that get rented by various companies and then arrive in Toronto or wherever. H how how is it created that that you know you may have a soprano who's um, Zaftig and one who's <laughs> beyond Zaftig? <laughs> oh, they're all. Um, <laughs> Are, are, are these things rebuilt or are they created completely from scratch again? Well, that kind of costuming is really a designer's nightmare. Um, I remember the, when Lachi Mansuri was still at the COC, the first uh, time I went there to do a Tales of Hoffman, um, and Malabar's uh, owned the costumes, and Malabar's built the costumes and then rented them to the COC. That was how it always worked. The COC didn't have the money for their own shops. They didn't have, build their own costumes at that point. And I was working with a Dutch director, and it was a kind of way out concept, but so what? It was modern. And um, I finished the costume sketches and took them into Malabar's, and uh, they said, no, we, we won't do these. We won't do these. We are not going to build them because we can't rent them. It's too out there, no one's going to want to rent these costumes. So in the end, I had to take existing costumes from another designer and put them with my set. And it's always and always a problem because they do, they're not, you know, they're not embarrassed to split up an opera into sets and costumes if, if, if that's a way to make money. But it is a bit of a design nightmare. I mean, there are opera singers who bring their own costumes. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. There are a lot of singers, uh, female singers who've sung the same role, who've done, you know, the Traviatas. Well, then they're going to do, the, they're going to bring their own outfit for the Traviata, whether it fits with your concept or not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it, it's, it's ideally, well, I just did memoirs from the House of the Dead. Well, no one's going to want to rent those kinds of <laughs> No problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a hundred prison uniforms, but but it is it it is always it is tricky, and it is true that um, it, how do you make them fit? And there's often a lot of bad alteration. I've seen uh, opera costumes move, you know, in Canada, move from one place to another that you know still had safety pins in the back because because that's all they were able to do or could alter. And it's never an ideal way to work, certainly. Now, the other thing is that um, uh, in terms of the sort of opera physique, that is changing. The, 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 over the, in this new generation, uh, opera singers are being trained as actors as much as singers. There's no more, you know, it's not just, what do we call it? Stand and deliver? Park and bark. <laughs> <laughs> An actor would never have said oh, that. No. And you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> no, but I'm going to use it. <laughs> so they're, they're, you know, they, they generally opera singers are are more slender than they used to be 50 years ago, for sure. Is it true there's different measuring tapes for opera shops? <laughs> <laughs> or just a rumor? No. It's different right. mirrors. <laughs> At Stratford, they have the skinny mirror and the, and the regular mirror. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks very much. Is it any other thoughts, comments?
Brilliant. And in terms of thanks, I'd also just like to thank our, our three panelists, of course, because they've been terrific. <laughs>